Welcome into another episode of New York Her. I'm your host, Caroline Hendershot, and today we have a very exciting guest, Dawn Aponte. She is the NFL's Chief Football Administrative Officer. Dawn, thank you so much for joining us. I'm so happy to have you on. Thanks, Caroline. Great to be here. Okay, so I don't know how many people know your whole history, but it is so impressive. You have been within the NFL, within teams and facets of the league for your entirety of your career. But I want you to start out with your current position and how you would describe your day to day. Sure. So my current position, it uh, it actually didn't exist before I came here. Uh, This is my second stint at the league office. Uh, And really what I enjoy about it is that it was a position that sort of was created to help, you know, kind of leverage my background and experience uh, and have really had great opportunity to be involved in a number of different areas, uh, including game operations, um, officiating, um, and a lot of other football operations matters uh, on a day-to-day basis. My current job in terms of day-to-day, now that we're in season, I spend the majority of my time really on a week-to-week basis with the games coming up the next week, depending upon uh, what certain issues arise. Uh, we had five international games, the final one coming up this Monday in Mexico City. So a lot more to be done when we're playing internationally since we control those games. Um, so during the year, really, it is mostly on the game operations side of things and dealing with officiating, uh, primarily administrative matters that come up. Uh, and then as we move on to postseason, uh, then that is full time pretty much um, overseeing all of the games we take control of postseason all the way through Super Bowl. Uh, and then we move into the offseason, which a lot of that entails kind of the uh, preparation for the upcoming season, everything from reviewing rules, uh, policies, uh, meeting with all of the different committees, the competition committee, the general manager's committee, the head coach's subcommittee. Uh, and really going into uh, annual meetings. So a lot of those things, again, so a lot of the off season is, is in preparation, similar to how it is at a club. Uh, we operate uh, like that here. Is there a big difference, and this seems like an obvious question, but is there a big difference in your workload from when you're in season versus when you're out of season, or is it pretty constant and nonstop? It's pretty constant and also kind of the similarities when you're in season, your your weeks are more structured. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, you kind of know what's coming on each day, what days that the games are going to be played, what days that you're dealing with other kind of off the field items or preparation. Um, So, yeah, I think in season it's. it's a it's busy, but it's a different kind of busy, a more structured busy versus the off season. Uh, you know, you just kind of popping around to different things and, and trying to kind of pull a lot of things together to get ready for the next year. Right. It's almost kind of nice in season because while you sometimes feel like a chicken running around with their head cut off because it's just so chaotic all the time. It is nice because there's structure to it. You know, like, you know that there's Sunday games, then, you know, there's Monday and Thursday. So it's nice to have a little bit more of a formulaic approach. But I want to go back to the beginning of your career, because a lot of people probably don't know you started with the Jets, which is so special, especially coming from here where I'm talking to you from Florham Park. But How did you initially get your first intern with the Jets? And then how did that role kind of transform? Because then you stayed with the Jets for a while, but took on a variety of different positions. Yep. So uh, complete happenstance. I started with the Jets in 1991. I was an accounting major in college and uh, someone was going on maternity leave. And at that time, they didn't have like we have today, internships and other people coming in from the outside. So I came there for a summer to fill in. Uh, I thought it was going to be sort of a one year thing, thought a good thing for my resume. Uh, And then after that summer, the Jets said, hey, would you be interested in coming back next season? I'm thinking, great. I you know, can do that for next summer because I was going into my junior year. Uh, And then after my second summer, they called and said that they were interested in creating a full time position in accounting and if I would be interested in taking that on. So, uh, again, super fortunate for how it worked out, but also, you know, it was um, it it really kind of launched my 30 plus years in the league by starting with the Jets and getting that opportunity. I know you took on the role of being a salary cap assistant at one point with the Jets. Now, just from a basic viewership standpoint, as like a basic fan, 
you know salary cap is obviously important, but how hard was that job kind of juggling all of those moving pieces and being able to make sure that the Jets were able to get all of the players they wanted and still remain under the salary cap? So it's interesting because at that time, when I first started, we didn't have a salary cap in the NFL. Mm -hmm. We were still implementing it. The NBA had one. Uh, the MLB, there's more of a luxury tax, but we had um, finally implemented it in 1994. Uh, and at that point, I was learning it along with everyone else in the league. So the synergy between sort of my numbers and finance side of things and then what really the salary cap was intended to do, uh, which was to kind of manage costs at the club level, uh, became sort of a, a natural, you know, sort of marriage for, for what I was doing. So it really gave me the opportunity of seeing how I could kind of take on some of that uh, role at the time uh, that nobody had. And really it was, um, it was both challenging as well as fulfilling. And that's how I got probably mostly into um, uh, most interested in sort of the football side of the business and really understanding that there was a lot more to that than just watching the players on the field at practice and on Sundays on game day. Mm -hmm. Did someone suggest this position to you or did you see it and know that like maybe I might be a good fit for it? So, yeah, there really wasn't a position at the time. Just like, okay, clubs are handed this number. Now you've got to figure all this out. At the time, our president uh, was Steve Gutman. Uh, and he was very involved in league matters. He represented Leon Hess, who owned the team at the time, on a lot of uh, club business. So he was inter integral in terms of uh, not only implementing the league-wide salary cap, but also as a mentor for me uh, in terms of explaining what, you know, how it was operating, what we needed to do. Uh, so also worked very closely with him at the time. Again, a tremendous opportunity for someone at 22 years old to be able to do. Now, he, you mentioned him being one of your mentors, but I've read that you've had some other pretty impressive mentors, including Mike Tannenbaum, Bill Belichick, Bill Parcells. One, I want to know how those relationships start to get formed, because I'm sure once you're in the league, you're meeting all of these people that are now just of such high stature, but they just seem like a normal guy to you because you probably have a lot of face time with them. Am I right? Yeah, it's funny. And, you know, back then I was in accounting direct deposit was not a thing. So everyone had to come and get their check. Mm -hmm. My office was outside of the men's locker room when we were out in Hempstead. So I actually got to see all of the coaches, all of the players coming in and out and just visually kind of, you know, kind of said hi on a regular basis. But then on payday, I was all of their friends. So um, <laughs> they would come by and pick up their checks. And you know, I think the other thing, uh, you, I feel fortunate for when I grew up in this business, because even though it was extremely male dominated, dominant, uh, it was also, I felt like people cared about me and I was told like, hey, don't fraternize with the players. It's going to be a perception issue. We didn't have a lot of females there at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, and I felt like I, I really had people kind of guiding me to not create like you know, the wrong perception. Uh, and I think, you know, the other piece of advice that I always used to get was like, you know, I, I, I like to talk a lot. And then uh, I was like, you know, God gave you two ears and one mouth for a reason. Take that into consideration. So, um, you know, I, I always kind of had the mentality, you just keep your head down, you work hard, and you'll be noticed. And I think that was a lot of the, you know, this goes to the question of building those relationships. And I think it was more through, um, my actions than my words that I felt that I was able to kind of build those relationships where I had those individuals coming to me asking questions. I started to, you know, make sure that I could become a collect the CBA expert as well as a salary cap expert mm -hmm. uh, and always just wanted to be a resource to be able to assist. And um, that sort of helped because I, I think it was more through uh, work than it was just personal. You mentioned being in a male dominated industry. Was that ever not necessarily a struggle, but maybe just a little lonesome at times, not having other women within the department or the building to really just get some perspective or ask different questions of, because I feel like from my point of view nowadays, I sit in a row and my entire row at work is all women. So that's like such a difference and such a night and day from what you've experienced. 
Yeah, I never honestly didn't really think about it at the time because I always felt like I was, you know, I was being sort of given an opportunity and I was just told, like, you have to prove yourself. You're going to be no different than any guy that's sitting next to you and you just need to work hard. And, you know, if you're committed to it and you're working and you'll be recognized for that. And I never really thought about, wow, I don't have any women who are helping me because I do think that I had a lot of men in positions of authority that sort of properly positioned me to take advantage of those opportunities. Do you feel, looking back on your career up until this point, that there was a moment that was really pivotal for you that kind of sticks out and maybe it really set you on the path that you are on today or just made you realize that this was the industry you were always meant to be in? So when I started, like I said, it was complete happenstance, but realized quickly that I did love working for a football organization, um, but also realized I don't want to do accounting for my whole career. Um, and I was married very young. I was 23, had my first child at 24, uh, and sat down for one of my reviews with my boss at the time. And he said to me, you know, you're doing a great job. This is great. And, you know, we're kind of mom and pop. You could, this is this will be great for you. You can have a family and, you know, stay in this role. And as uh, we move on, you can move up. And, um, you know, when you say pivotal, pivotal, it was one of those things that I, I thought at the time, like, oh, my, like, this is not what I want to do for my whole career. So really got me thinking, like, what do I need to do to put myself in the best position to take advantage of any opportunity? If, in fact, I, I had said I wanted to go to the football side and kind of got a chuckle and was like, oh, that's cute. Like, you know, but that's not going to happen. You know, culturally, that's just not going to be accepted. And I thought, wow, that's crazy. Like, that was the first time I kind of ever felt like, you know, so because I'm a female, I can't do that. Mm -hmm. um, but I thought to myself, you have one of two ways to take this. Like, you could argue the point, which isn't going to get you anywhere. Or you can actually, you know, take matters in your own hands and do whatever you can um, to make sure that you are in a position that you can't be compared to anybody else, male, female, uh, that would be better suited. Um, and that's kind of what put me on. I went for my master's. I got my CPA. I went to law school at night. Um, so I just said, I'm going to do all of these things and really try to figure out, um, you know, how to kind of get to that next step wherever it is. So with those next steps came you then in 2006 six ish right around then you went to the NFL and you worked as the VP labor of finance. Then you went with the Browns as the VP of football administration, then to the Dolphins as the SVP of football operations. And now you're back with the NFL with such an ever changing business. How have you managed to not only just change with the business as it grows and as it continues to expand, like you were saying, international games and all of that, but just move around and be like malleable in that sense. First and foremost, family commitment. <laughs> um, they're all on board. I have a wonderful husband and four kids who have been on this journey. Uh, and I think we've really always approached it as such. Like this is, you know, life is a journey. It wasn't about finding a job, you know, having a house and saying we're going to, you know, plant ourselves here and stay here. It was sort of like, what's the next adventure? Um, and they've been on board the whole time. And I really feel like that has been uh, the biggest part of kind of being willing to take those steps and, uh, you know, try new things. And I do like new jobs, new opportunities, and particularly new challenges. So um, every time I made a move, it was really, you know, in my mind, it wasn't necessarily I'm looking for my next job, but kind of started feeling like, okay, I, you know, fit, hit a bit of a ceiling and I'm ready for that next challenge. Um, and that sort of opened me up. How do I take the next step where I can contribute with all of my skills and experience, but also learn and, and grow, continue to grow? With all of those different moves that you experienced and going to those different teams, do you feel like there's a favorite memory where you look back on your whole path and all those different teams and positions that you held and think, I can't believe that happened or it still makes you laugh or is there a moment that stands out to you like that? There's probably so many I couldn't <laughs> narrow it down. Um, but I think the common theme of it was really the people that I've worked with over 30 plus years. And, you know, you have 
you, you kind of you cross paths so many times. And, uh, you know, when I was leaving to go to the Jets, uh, when I was leaving the Jets to go to the league office, um, Herm Edwards had been the head coach back then. Um, and he was transitioning, going to Kansas City. I was pregnant with twins. The league office called and asked me about this job. I wasn't really looking to leave. Um, and it just was the right thing for me, the right time. I was living in the city. Uh, and Eric, we wound up hiring Eric Mangini as our head coach. And Eric was there in the 90s um, as a position coach. And then we stayed in contact when he went up to New England. And then he came back and he said, OK, you're not leaving. And I was like, no, no, I'm leaving. Like, I've already committed. I'm going. And um, he's like, no, we want you to stay. And I was like, that's great. But, you know, I've made the decision. And he said, OK, he's like, well, we're going to work together again someday. Um, and I'm thinking, yeah, OK, whatever, you know, whenever that happens. Um, and, you know, fast forward three years when Eric got the job in Cleveland, he called and he was like, maybe can you give me some recommendations for somebody for this position? I did. A couple of days later, he called back. He goes, how about you? I'm like, oh, gosh, I can't I can't go to Cleveland. That's my, my family will kill me. I can't move out of here. You know, kids are in school now. And uh, I went on the visit and I called home and I said, I think we're going to move to Cleveland. So, um, you know, my family remembers some of those market moments similar to a year later when we went to Miami and they're like, we're going where? <laughs> you know? See, it's so yeah. crazy how those moments are so full circle and you, you say to those people, no, I don't think that's going to happen. And then yeah. sure enough, it always Anything does. Happen. Yep. Yep. But I know you grew up on Long Island. Did you ever think, did you love football from such a young age or did you ever think that your whole career would be in football and let alone the National Football League or, or did that just kind of happen by chance? It really happened by chance. I mean, we were a huge New York Giants family. Mm -hmm. um, so football was always, you know, on on Sundays in the house. And my grandfather was a huge Giants fan. Um, but when we got to the Jets, um, almost everyone transitioned to be a Jet fan. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, no, I never thought that I'd spend my career in it again cannot be you know more fortunate for having the opportunities I've had and it's an amazing you know sport it's a great business and amazing people throughout my career um, you know and you just you never forget like you know in your your sort of carve different pieces I've got you know a piece of my heart at the Jets a piece of the Browns and a piece of the Dolphins so um, you know you sort of always are rooting for those teams in particular and then your kids depending upon the age that they grow up I have a 10 year span <laughs> Uh, my oldest now is 26 and I have twin 16 year olds. So, um, you know, they all have different experiences at the different teams. So my son today, the 26 year old remembers the Jets, Jets Fest. Um, you know, before the game, we would go there. He would kind of go and, uh, you know, do all the activities before the game. And uh, he sat in regular seats when we were at the Jets. So he's the tougher one. <laughs> so. so before I ask you my last question, I, I have to ask you, what would you tell people when they ask you the question of what aspect about your job would surprise people the most? Because while you're going, 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 and everyone assumes, okay, it's all about football all the time, is there a part of your job that maybe isn't as glamorous or people don't even know that you really take care of a lot of this one subject? Is there any surprises that come along with your job? every day i mean you know i i laugh where i was um a, two two or three years ago i was in kansas city we had a postseason game and you know the benches weren't getting cleared off enough and i was there with one of my one of the people i work with another female and we're out there and we've got snow and everything uh you know on the benches and nobody's clearing it off and we're you know like okay let's go and we just go and we're you know soaking wet <laughs> neck to, to foot like just you know stuff has to get done i think i think it's just more about making sure in this business it really is about pitching in we talk about teamwork all the time uh there are tasks every day big and small that we do um and i think that's really what makes it great because i think that most of the people in this business understand that uh in any way that you can contribute to the team's overall success whether you're at a club or at um at the league office uh, it really is about, you know, there's a lot of things that are probably less glamorous than more glamorous. Yeah, I feel like that's an aspect that 
people sometimes forget because they think NFL, they think football. Oh, man, you just get to watch football all the time. That's the life. I wish that was my job. And there's so much more that goes into it behind the scenes, of course. But before I let you go, I have to ask you, and I know part of your heart lays in Cleveland, part of your heart lays in Miami, but the Jets, the 2022 Jets, who... I feel as though I haven't been a surprise to anyone in the building because we've kind of seen that team build throughout the off season and we've watched them through training camp, but a little bit of a shock to people outside the building. What have you thought of their performance and just the competitive nature of not only the AFC East, but just the NFL this year? It seems like each game is just crazier than than the next each week. It, it's incredible. It really is. I mean, and obviously growing up in New York and whether that's the Jets or the Giants, still also a fan of both. But, um, you know, being at the Jets for 15 plus years, like I said, I have a lot of history there. Uh, you know, super excited for the people at the organization, including, you know, starting with Woody Johnson and Chris Johnson and, um, you know, knowing all the time, effort and resources that they put into the team. Uh, I think it's just awesome for, you know, for New York fans that, you know, they're getting the type of football that they they want and expect and uh and i think that you know just the nfl overall it's it's amazing on a week-to-week basis the parity and the competitiveness uh amongst all of the teams that makes it so exciting it it really does it has been nothing short of exciting but Don, thank you so much for sharing your entire career. It's been an honor to get to talk to you for as long as we've gotten today. But seriously, thank you so much. We appreciate it. And thanks so much for the time. Thanks. Have a great day. Thanks so much for listening to another episode of New York Her. Make sure you rate, review, like, and subscribe on the iHeartRadio app or wherever you listen to your podcast. That's all from us this week. And we will see you soon on the next New York Her.